The startup chapter it's like an association of startups all over the Gambia, startups in all sectors of the economy. The idea is basically to bring startups together um, to share a common platform where they could interact, where they could network, where they could share um, some some experiences uh, as in transfer of technology. Um, what happened is that in the Gambia we realized that um, it takes too long for a startup to graduate to another category, that is to scale up. Um, some people in the Gambia, even up to 10 years, still call themselves a startup, and which should not be the case. So I think that's the mo main motive why we had to set up this chapter, in order to support startups to scale up. I mean, these, the, the support comes in various and different formats, uh, formats in terms of maybe the linkages especially in terms of the seminars that you coordinate, organize for them, in terms of um, linking them with even potential investors and even forums such as this of where they could also get to meet um, potential partners that they could work with. So basically, in a nutshell, that's the idea. And not only uh, networking with them themselves, because we want to also bring the aspect of how can government support in terms of policy makers, how they can also support startups in creating favorable policies for them. I think it's just quite challenging as a, as a startup. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, startups, youth, entrepreneurs. Uh, we're very grateful, first of all, from the GCCI. We want to start by saying that we want to thank you very, very, very much for the commitment that you have demonstrated to be here and most importantly for coming on time. This is very important to us and we recognize that it's very important to, to commit to being part of something that we all believe in. This platform will be a very important one in the sense that it will educate and you will also equally have the opportunity to be educated by some people that will be here. It will also avail the opportunity to be inspired, but also to inspire others. We trust you, we believe in you, and we encourage you always. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Umi, and I am pleased to welcome you to the first National Startup Forum. I am proud as a Gambian to be here at an event that was undoubtedly provoked by the growing enthusiasm of youths and women to start up businesses, not only to create better livelihoods, but to contribute to the socio-economic development of the Gambia and ultimately to the global community. Um, I think it's unprecedented that we've had um, so many startup businesses in the Gambia within the period of a decade. That um, we've, we've always had businesses starting up and uh, people creating businesses, selling one service, one product or another. But my emphasis here is on registered startups. I would just like to advise you to um, not confine, not let you have to object to being confined to the limitations and challenges of the environment you operate in. If you say, well, there's limited finance for startups, so I'm going to wait until there's enough for us for me to be able to finance my business, then you'll always be a step behind. So go out, look for the things you need, and don't wait until it's available to you. And um, I look forward to two days of intense interactions, networking, and building each other up. Thank you. I think we need to look at each other as partners and stop looking at each other as competitors. So I know it's a very interesting session. I would love to continue, but time is against us.
Konrad is a political NGO based out of Germany and they develop capacity across um, Africa. We first met them um, in Dakar when we were there to attend a forum um, and we invited them to come to Gambia in 2017 and since then they have been very supportive of the Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry and also other um, youth and non-governmental organizations in the country. As a business owner yourself, um, what what were some of the challenges? You were once a startup before. Um, what were some of the challenges you encountered? And is there any difference between your challenges and the challenges um, of today? Actually, I'm just starting another startup. <laughs> so to me, it's a continuous process of disruption, creating, um, taking challenges. I don't like to use w the word problem taking challenges and converting it into opportunities. But um, what I always tell people, it doesn't matter what challenge you have, you have to figure out how do I pivot and change that challenge and convert it into an opportunity by creating a market or providing a service that somebody is willing to pay. And I think the biggest challenge we had in the beginning always was people's mindset and perception. But those are things that as an entrepreneur, if you package it properly, you can basically get people willing to pay for it and deliver. Um, my favorite quote is, I'm in a jalo of chop shop. It's like restaurant quality, fast food price. I was in a uh, university in Canada, and this is 2005. And um, a few of my friends and I um, started printing t-shirts that had uh, different meanings of them, of different African leaders like Nelson Mandela, Kwame Nkrumah, and things like that. And it was never a business. It was just something we liked to do. And um, eventually, you know how it is, your friends say, oh, make me one. Can I have one? Can I have one? And eventually, I was spending too much time making shirts for my friends. So I started charging them for it. And that's how I became an entrepreneur. I didn't know I was an entrepreneur at the time until um, I realized this is kind of fun and um, I can structure this into a business. And I learned we eventually built that business and started selling in three different countries from Canada, Caribbean, and Africa. So um, that's how I started. In 2010, I decided to come back to Gambia and um, with the sole purpose of building something of value in Gambia. I didn't know what it was going to be yet, but I knew it was going to be in the agriculture subsector. Um, reason being, uh, I felt that this was the most opportunity to have impact in people's lives in Gambia because at least 70% of our population are involved in this trade and it, yet it is still one of the most underdeveloped sectors in our economy. So for me, that was a huge opportunity. Um, I do believe that um, taking our local resources, adding some value, can really build something great and substantial in the country. So um, I started uh, with uh, the peanut business. And um, this is, this is a, one of those lessons I was uh, saying. Why did I start with the peanut business? It wasn't because I liked peanuts or knew anything about peanuts. Um, it was based on data. Um, for me, in order to have a successful business in Gambia, you must make sure that your primary raw material is abundant and is cheap. That gives you a competitive advantage. So my primary decision to going into the peanut business is because Gambia has a competitive advantage in peanuts. So now I knew what I wanted to do. I had no idea how to do it. And now um, I remember there was, I was looking for a customer. Because for me, buying peanuts was, sounded easy. Selling it was the hard part. So I started looking for a customer, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Jimpex area. There's a lot of warehouses, and I used to see a lot of peanut trucks going in that area. So um, I went door to door, and I was asking people in Jimpex, do you know anybody who buys peanuts, who does peanut business? And I remember, I'll never forget this, I met um, a Malayan um, laborer, and he told me, yes, I heard of one Chinese guy, he wants to buy $10 million worth of peanuts. And for me, I heard $10 million, and that was it. I was like, this is it, I have to find the guy. So I start now looking, I'm like, have you see, heard of a Chinese guy buying, buying peanuts? And nobody knew of this Chinese guy. And um, then somebody, one, one guy also in Jimpex, says like, well, I know a Chinese guy with a warehouse. He might be the guy. So he takes me to see this Chinese person. Long story short, he didn't have $10 million, but he was buying peanuts. And um, I told him, listen, I, I just want to learn uh, about the peanut business. And he's like, well, can you supply me? And like a lot of startups at the time. I wasn't even a business. I can't even call myself a startup at the time. Dig it, Boparek. I said, yes. I don't know where to get peanuts from apart from Masa Sergunda. 
So he, he says, okay, um, supply me 100 tons. And in my head, I was thinking, oh my God, 100 tons. So I, I, um, I started asking around, going all around the country looking for peanuts, causing myself a whole lot of problems, promising people things I could not deliver. And um, eventually came back, um, you know, when, you're, when you come back completely embarrassed, come back to him and say, listen, I promised you the world, but I can't even get you one kilo of peanuts. And he asked me why. And I gave him a detailed breakdown on why I wasn't competitive in doing it. And he laughed. And he, he told me, um, you know, I was testing you. I knew you couldn't do this. I was testing you, but the reason I wanted you to go through this is to see whether you would come back and tell me the truth, or you just say, no problem, no problem tomorrow. And since you came back, come, let me show you how to do it properly. So that's the second important lesson. Due to my honesty and realizing that I couldn't do it, somebody gave me a chance. Somebody saw potential in me, somebody gave me a chance. And that's something that every startup needs. You need people to believe in you, and you need to be able to deliver when they believe in you. Um, everybody has a helping hand somewhere, and that was mine. And he put me into the business. He taught me from start to finish. And if, after a year working with him, I was supplying to him. I told him, listen, I want to be an exporter. I'm not, I'm not satisfied with just being a local supplier to you. I want to be an exporter. And he said, no problem. Um, are you ready to be an exporter? And again, as you know, as entrepreneurs, yes, I am. Uh, I didn't know it was so hard. But he taught me, showed me the ropes. And um, eventually, within three years, we were exporting. Um, 2,000 tons of groundnuts to China. Um, this is coming from where I couldn't even get him 100 tons. Uh, so we grew very fast. And um, I do credit a lot of my um, early success to him. Now, when, once the groundnut business was growing and it was successful, uh, well, successful, um, I started looking at um, what is the next value chain in Gambia that I want to be involved in. Um, I'd made a little bit of money, and um, I didn't want to spend I'm really scared of losing money. So I didn't want to spend it all quickly. And the ground season, if you know, it's very short. It's from December to March, and then the rest of the year you travel and you spend all your money, and then in November you're broke again. So I didn't want that to happen to me. Um, so I decided to invest in a mango factory. Uh, now, again, it goes back to my principle. Before I go into a business, I look at my competitive advantage. And in the Gambian, in the agriculture sector, if you notice, um, we have three things in abundance. Uh, that's uh, definitely groundnuts, definitely cashews, and definitely mangoes. So any one of those three for me would be a competitive advantage to anyone because I can get them easily. Uh, well, I thought I could get them easily. That's another story. So, um, and the mango season also coincides with the off season for, for um, groundnuts, whereas groundnuts ends in March, mangoes start in May. So in my head, I was like, okay, April, I go for holiday. May I start again, right? So I invest um, in a uh, mango factory. Um, and it was a toss up between, do I make mango juice? Do I make dried mango? And again, to this, I go to, what's my competitive advantage? Um, I looked around, I studied, and I took a lot of time to travel around to different mango factories around the world. I went to uh, China, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and I saw what they were doing. I decided that, um, actually I remembered that when I was in university, I used to buy dried mangoes from the supermarket for $10 for 100 grams, which is like this small. And in my head I was like, that's $450. Mango is $10 in Gambia. There's money to be made here. So that was, that was my business plan initially. <laughs> and um, then I just went about trying to figure out how to make dried mangoes efficiently. And that's what took me on this journey to start visiting different, um, different uh, suppliers. Now, this didn't solve the problem. It's very easy to buy the machines and to build the factory if you have the money. That's the easy part. How do you sell it? How do you get the people to work in the factory? How do you get the right qualifications? So now I'm racking my brain, all right, if I build this factory, where am I gonna sell the dried mangoes? I know that in Gambia, nobody's going to buy dried mangoes when you can go and buy man get mangoes from your trees for free. So I have to export it. How do I find an export partner? And this is where your entrepreneurial spirit, uh, uh, spirit has to come in. You have to be curious. So every time I travel, if I'm interested in a product and I go to a supermarket and they're selling it there, I look on the back of it and I see where it's made and who the supplier is. I, always, I do that wherever I go. Um, my wife is here, she will attest, and it's, that is very annoying, that I always stop and say, oh, 
you see that over there, look, it's made in South Africa, right? And I try and contact the company. So what I did was I started contacting the, who are my competitors, the drag companies around the world. And I got in contact with um, oh, the one in Nigeria, who today is one of my biggest clients, um, and also put me in contact with the right place to get the best machinery. Now, when I went to get the machinery, I was in South Africa with the um, manufacturer. I told him, I want to see the different factories you've put this in. And knowing that whoever is drying mangoes is a potential customer for me. So wherever he put the machines in, he gave me their contact, and I flew there to meet them. And um, today, I have three major export clients for my dried mangoes. And each one of those, I met through my machine supplier. So that's how, so that is, that is an easy um, entrepreneurial way to find customers. Just be curious and you'll, don't be scared of the journey. You don't know where it's going to take you. A lot of people are very excited to meet other entrepreneurs, especially if you're young and you're trying. Um, all it did, took for me was to send an email to uh, one of these big companies and tell them, listen, I'm, I'm from Gambia, I'm building a drying facility. Um, I would like to come and see yours. And they, they all thought I was crazy. They didn't believe uh, that I would come. And so they obviously send an email back, sure, come whenever you want. Okay, great, I'll be there next week. And I'll just go, uh, not knowing what to expect, but then building relationships with those people. And um, four years later, we're doing great business with them. Um, we, started, uh, we started by um, not even being able to export out of West Africa. And uh, this year, we've started, um, we got the right certifications to export anywhere in the world. So that journey was also helped along by our, our customers. Now, um, the next journey, uh, the next thing as well is, um, I am here today because I was a startup once. I still consider myself a startup, but according to uh, Modu's description, it's three years. So. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a startup, and I wonder if I'm still a youth. Am I? Yes? Okay. Um, ah, okay. Okay, great. So I, I tick the youth box. So um, the, the other one is um, my journey didn't happen overnight. I struggled a lot. Um, I've been, business is all I know um, in terms of a professional career. I've never worked in anything, I've never worked a job in my life um, because I was in university when I started. And that was 2005. That's a 14 year old journey. And all the knowledge and everything that I know now is as a result of the struggles and that journey. So my advice to all startups is embrace the struggle, the journey. Um, if you're really passionate about um, entrepreneurship and what you're doing, you'll find pleasure and joy in those struggles. Um, just a few minutes ago, I was discussing with my brother here about, uh, he asked me how is business and I told, you it's very, I told him it's very difficult. And he asked me, why do all businessmen in Gambia say it's very difficult? I told him it's, it's difficult. But the thing is, we enjoy the challenge. I think that um, as soon as my business starts becoming simple and there's no other problems to solve and it's streamlining, I'll get bored. I think that is one thing that all entrepreneurs have in common. You might not know it now, but wait until everything is good. Um, when I was doing the ground business and everything was going well and the rest of the year I didn't have anything to do, I was bored out of my mind. I needed to find something to do. And so all the struggles that you're experiencing now, just know that it is part of the journey. Everybody struggles and it's not going to stop as, as long as you're growing. If the struggle stops, you, you're not growing. You're not growing. Um, and I think, yes, I think that covers my entire journey. Oh, well, where I'm at now and where we're going. So like I said, I might not be a startup anymore where I'm in the scale up um, stage of my business, which is what right after startup you hope to scale up. Uh, we're growing our business. Um, this is probably the most challenging part. If you thought starting up was hard, wait till you have to scale up. And um, what we're, where we're trying to go is we're trying to build um, a company that legacy outlives me which means putting in the right structures, which means putting in the right um, operational um, procedures so that the company can work without me 
um, being so tied to it. Um, this is very important, and I wish I had done this earlier in my career. Um, so it's an advice I'd like to give a lot of you. Um, as entrepreneurs, we tend to want to have control of every aspect of our business, um, which, is, which is not a bad thing per se, but you're more powerful and more effective if you empower people to run your business for you. Um, and this is a very important thing that I've learned over, over time. Uh, as my business got bigger and there were more and more people, it just got impossible to try to have my hand in everything. Um, so you get the right people, the experts, to do everything you want to do. Make sure you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you so you can learn off of them. And you um, set yourself up as the leader, as, as, as the, um, the motivator, as the direction for the company. I think that's very important. That's the stage I'm in right now. Um, learning a lot in that process, so maybe in three years I'll be back to come and explain to you that journey. Thank you very much. Um, well, Tropingo Foods is a food processing company, um, an agribusiness um, exporter based in the Gambia. Um, what we do is we aggregate um, raw materials from a network of different farmers around the country and also in the sub-region um, to our processing plants here in Gambia where we make various products and export around the world. How long have you been in business? Um, Tropingo Foods was established in 2014. so. So when you were starting, did you encounter any challenges or constraints? Absolutely. Um, we, we encountered quite a few challenges when we started like any other business. Um, one for example, uh, which everyone always uh, talks about is the access to capital to start. So um, we, def we definitely had to build um, our capital one step at a time by um, trading, um, getting the raw materials selling them and really saving our profits for a long period of time. Second was also the, um, the human resource capacity. Um, when we started, there wasn't really any knowledge on, for example, food treat dehydration in Gambia. So um, developing the techniques, hiring the right people with the right experience has and still continues to be a huge challenge um, right now. Um, considering your area of business and how it's not very common in the Gambia, did you have all of the resources, tools and equipment that you need when you were starting your business? Uh, no, not at all. Um, we built our equipment list over time. Um, for example, um, we're the first commercial um, head which is in Gambia. Um, at the time, there weren't any even ideas of how to do this in Gambia. Even as we speak now, where we're expanding, um, most of the equipment that we need, uh, we have to import or have to in order. Um, however, there are also um, other parts of our business where the expertise and the knowledge and the equipment or other institutions in terms of human resource or just capital? Absolutely. Um, we, we always have support from government, non-governmental organizations, um, especially on the technical capacity building. Um, we do get a lot of support from um, the EU um, and a few other organizations, especially to meet standards, um, meet export standards. One of the most difficult parts of food processing for export is um, the standard requirement of the countries of destination. And um, to implement those things and the procedures, um, we've definitely been able to leverage a lot from, um, from government. Okay, so do you have any recommendations for government? Because in the sessions we realized that the government is not really playing a huge role in the startups or helping them get their businesses ordered or something. So do you have any recommendations that you would like to give to government? Um, I believe that government's uh, job should be to curate a conducive environment and less of interfere in, um, 
in the marketplace. Uh, I believe, for example, as one of the speakers said earlier, that there should be a procurement quota for young startups and young businesses for uh, government procurement. I think that's a very good uh, tangible um, example of what government can do without asking government for too much. Um, I also believe that um, in the sectors, for example, the peanut sector, I believe that government should liberalize the sector um, and uh, really allow the private sector and the market to determine um, determine the, 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 the economics of the sector. Uh, I believe that government should not be in the business of doing business. I believe the government should be in the business of creating the space for businesses to thrive. So along the way, what lessons have you learned that you would want to advise new startups on? There are so many lessons. You, you learn lessons every day in, in business. Um, but there are key things that I believe um, are unique to startups in Gambia. And um, one of those is, like I said earlier, um, most of the questions um, I hear from startups these days is, what do you have for me? Or how can you help me? And um, I think that startups should understand or should embrace uh, the idea that being an entrepreneur is about going to get, it's not about going to ask. Um, we do tend to fall into this trap of dependency. Um, there's a lot of programs, yes, which are great for training and helping entrepreneurs, but that shouldn't be the reason why you're in entrepreneurship. I believe that um, we must be able to create um, value from our business activities, and if there's support that comes, it's an additional help. I believe that we shouldn't be early to go and look for investment because we end up spending all of our time looking for investment rather than building a business. So my advice to startups is focus on your business, be passionate about it and implement it. Um, don't expect any handouts from anybody and don't build your business based on what different institutions or different businesses can do for you. Your business should be based on what you can go and do to build your business. And that's, I think that's one of, of key advice that many Gambian entrepreneurs need to um, take seriously. Yeah. So um, as a businessman, what, uh, what, what do you do to empower young startups in form of mentorship or anything? So I do mentor quite a few um, business people. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the, um, the how do you quote unquote popular brands that you see locally um, are a result of people I do, men I do mentor um, privately, um, but we also go further. Um, our entire business model is to develop a value chain and um, within our value chain there are quite a few young entrepreneurs who businesses depend on our sourcing. So for example, um, we do have uh, suppliers who, who their entire business is aggregating um, aggregating and supplying raw materials from Gambia and Senegal. These are young people who make a living from just supplying us. I believe that the greatest way to empower person or somebody is to support their business by doing business with them, not by giving a handout. The other thing I can give is my advice and my direction. Um, I'm not really a huge fan of um, handouts to businesses in terms of uh, help in that way. But everybody does need help at some point. But it's just a matter of identifying what you need as a starter um, from me and coming and getting it. And, um, yeah, so that's how we usually help and trying to instill that entrepreneurial mindset, that go-getter mindset in people who want to do business. I make sure that everybody who's around me um, understands what it means to be a business person. It's not a fun, exciting, um, glamorous life. It's the people who make it in this business are the people who are absolutely go-getters and don't care whether you help them or not, right? And I, I look for people who feel as though they're going to make it with or without my help or with or without anyone's help. That's the best person to help. Okay, so that's all the questions I have. Thank you.